the history of this project, I want to go back a little bit. So this was Jesse Prince's idea, which I want to make sure people know. Jesse had this idea in, I don't know, 2007 or something, that when people think about identity and philosophy, they've tended to think what matters are things like memory. That's what makes you the same person across time. You have to have the same memories or some kind of memory relation. But Jesse thought, I bet morality is actually more important. That what matters is the persistence of your moral traits. And so Jesse and I ran a bunch of little um, slightly hokey vignettes to try to look at this. So here's one of them. We say, imagine that you're, you're walking um, in a mountain trail, and you fall and you hit your head. And then in one condition, they were told, after this, you lose your memory. You can't remember anything that happened before. Um, and in the other condition, um, but, but everything else about you is the same. Your character traits, your moral attitudes are the same. And in the other condition, they're told, um, you hit your head. You can remember everything exactly the same way. Your cognitive abilities are the same. But your moral values have changed. Before, you were very generous. And now you just do things um, for your own self-interest. And then we ask people, um, in this scenario, to what extent are you the same person as before the accident? And what we found is when we told them that the, your morals had changed, they thought that you weren't the same person. But when we told them your memories had changed, then they thought that you still were the same person. So the fact that the, the moral traits seemed to be what really mattered uh, was what we were interested in. And then Nina Strominger and I, um, she's a social psychologist, and she can design better experiments than Jesse and I could. So she and I ran a bunch of experiments looking, that's just like straight honest, like <laughs> that's just, we, we don't have those skills. Um, so she and I ran a bunch of experiments looking at this further to try to see um, where the moral self effect would show up. So let me just tell you about one study that goes at it in a very different direction. We told people to imagine that reincarnation was real and you had to decide um, whether a given trait would be preserved in reincarnation. So, and we just asked people about um, particular pairwise comparisons between two traits and we use moral traits and non-moralized personality traits. And we just asked them, you know, to what extent do you think this would carry on in reincarnation? And the idea is that, well, you think the self persists in reincarnation. And what we found was that each one of the moral traits people thought was more likely to persist in reincarnation than any of the non-moralized personality traits. And we found this in all kinds of different, we found this effect in many ways. Like, this turns out to be incredibly robust. You cannot miss the moral self effect. This is one of those studies, like, so many studies that you run just don't work and don't work and don't work. This study never not works. It always works. Um, so we call this the moral self effect, that judgments about personal identity depend most strongly on the continuity of morality or moral traits. We found this, as I said, in lots of different versions of these vignettes. I think the most striking thing that we found was that we asked people who had loved ones with dementia, either Alzheimer's or frontal temporal dementia. Um, Alzheimer's is mostly associated with memory problems, lots of other things, but memory is really central. Frontal temporal dementia is, is associated with moral problems, people losing self-control, behaving badly, being unkind. And we asked people the extent to which they thought their loved one was still the same person as before dementia. And morality drove everything. The only thing that explained people's judgments about whether their loved one was the same person was morality. Memory didn't matter at all. What people cared about was morality. And we got emails after this paper came out saying this, this is exactly my experience. My father had um, Alzheimer's and he couldn't remember anything, but he was still the same sweet guy. That He was always the same person. Another person wrote to us and said, my husband had frontal temporal dementia and he was not the same person. After frontal temporal dementia, he treated me like he treated me terribly and he never did that before. That wasn't the same guy. So we got these really striking testimonials after we published these results. So that's the, the background um, to the project. And what we wanted to do with this for the SMB project was look at two questions. The first one is, why do we get this effect? Why is there this moral self effect? So, so what kinds of thought processes are involved in generating this view that morality is the core for personal identity? Then the other question was, um, to what extent does the moral self effect, or how does it show up in places where you think there really might be identity change in the world, real cases? And I'm gonna talk about the first question, which is effectively a question about the mechanisms of the moral self effect. And this is a question of primary interest to me as a philosopher of cognitive science. So um, one possibility, the one that um, has been at least suggested in the literature is that there's something strategic about this, that the reason people track morality 
is because that's the kind of thing that would matter for cooperation. So here's Jeff Goodwin. People should be concerned about others' moral character because the goodness of another person's character um, determines whether they're likely to be harmful or helpful to the self. And so this suggests that maybe there's this kind of functional, fu functional basis for the moral self-effect. It's because those are the kinds of things you'd want to pay attention to for things like cooperation and affiliation. A different theory is that what's driving these effects is what you value. So it's not about affiliation, it's about what you yourself value. So if I value some trait, this is the suggestion of this theory, if I value a trait, then I think that trait is important to the self, that's the hypothesis, and so when that trait changes, I'll think that the self has changed. So it doesn't matter here whether it affects cooperation, it's just do I value it? It's not about cooperation, it's about the things I value in my sense that those are the things that matter to the self. So one prediction of this value-based approach is that if you found a population that didn't care that much about moral traits, didn't value moral traits, then you should see less of a moral self-effect in that population. But the affiliation account doesn't make that prediction because it still would be strategic to engage in those, to, to look for people who had those particular kinds of moral traits. And so to investigate this, we looked at people um, who scored high on the psychopathy scale, a subclinical scale of psychopathy. Um, and what, we've, what our prediction was, people who score high on this scale will show less of a moral self effect. They'll think that it's less important for persistence of self that the, the moral traits are preserved. And we did this in a few different ways. I'm just gonna present one. So this, this is a study where we asked people, um, uh, imagine you meet somebody that you've known for a long time, but they have started, um, they've started to show some age-related dementia on various features, and some of the features were moral features, and some of them were personality features, and then the, the, the bar on the far right, that's people who were low on the psychopathy scale, um, and they show a very typical, as you would expect, moral self-effect. Those are the most important traits. People who were high on the psychopathy scale, on the other hand, show a much deflated sense in which the, the moral traits are important. Um, okay, so, so that suggests that there's something about the value-based value approach that seems plausible, but there are two very different kinds of value-based approaches that we want to distinguish. It might be that moral traits matter because they're moral, that it's that special domain, or it might be that moral traits matter because they're things that people value. It's the value itself that's important. So the idea, and I'll, I'll try to make this clear um, with the experiments, but so if you think that what matters is the moral domain, you'd think that's a special thing, that people do treat morality as special. There's lots of work on this, morality is a special domain, and you might think changes of, in that domain are what people are tracking. Um, and then you could think, well, as it happens, people high in psycho psychopathic tendencies have less of a sharp discrimination between moral characteristics and other characteristics. So one explanation of the effect for psychopaths is they just don't care as much about this special domain. So it's that special domain that matters. An alternative hypothesis is it's actually nothing special and theoretically special about morality. Um, what matters is just what you value. And you value morality, and so that shows up. That's one of the things that will show up. But the moral self-effect is really just the product of this general fund, this general thing that what you value, whatever it is, moral or otherwise, is what drives this judgment. So insofar as I value something, I'll think it's important for identity. Um, now, for, um, uh, so for people, in psychopath, for people in the psychopathy study, the explanation here would just be, well, it's not because morality is special, it's just because they care less about morality. Why does the moral self-effect show up only for morality, though. So what we find is that you don't get this result for other kinds of traits. So um, our prediction was that, well, what's going on with other traits, like take a non-moralized trait like something like um, adventurousness. We thought, well, maybe the reason you don't get um, an effect for, for adventurousness is because there's just too much variation in who values adventurousness. Everybody values morality except psychopaths, um, and even they value it a little bit, but um, 
So everybody values morality, so it's a very homogeneous kind of question, but not everybody values adventurousness, and so even if the valuing is what matters, we might not get the effect. So if valuing is really what matters, then individual differences in value should um, matter for uh, the judgments um, of identity. Let me, let me spell this out a little bit more with the, so this is a 64, these are 64 adjectives that we've used in various studies. These are actually ranked from most moral to least moral. If you look at the, the top 10 or so, honesty, integrity, justice, trustworthiness, everybody cares about those things. And so it's no wonder that when you run a study, those things come out. Like if you think that what matters is valuing, everybody values those things. And so if those change, then the value theory says insofar as those change, people will think you're a different person. Whereas when you come over here to like ebullience and energy and austerity, there's a lot of variation in whether those things, people value those things. The prediction of the value-centric account says, well, let's just pick one of these things. Let's just look at this one. If you think that um, composure is something you really value, then the prediction is the person who thinks composure is really valuable, a valuable trait, that person will think composure is important for identity. And so that's what we investigated. So, the way we did it was um, we used those 64 items um, and people got, they were asked about each of those items, a series of questions. The first thing they were asked is, what if um, you took a drug and it eliminated that trait? It eliminated trustworthiness or it eliminated ebullience. Um, um, to what extent um, do you think that would change your identity? To what extent you would be a different person if you took that drug? And then they were asked, after that, they were asked a series of questions. One was to see whether they thought that this trait was important for relationships, so how important is it for choosing partners and friends. Um, another one was just to determine the extent to which the, the trait described them, so to what extent is this, does this characterize you. And then the two we were most interested in were um, how related to morality is each of the um, is each of these traits. So how related to morality is trustworthiness? How related to morality is um, adventurousness? And then finally, how much do you value each of these traits? And so what we found, well, so the, the morality story would say, well, what really should drive this effect is whether something is moral. And the value-centric account would say, no, what really should drive it is just whether you value it. So it doesn't matter whether it's adventurousness or trustworthiness, what matters is valuing. Um, and what we found was very strong support for the value-centered account. So valuing was the strongest predictor of judged identity. So the extent to which people value a trait predicts the extent to which they think it matters for being the same person. Um, affecting relationships was also um, a predictively, um, you, it was a, predict, a strong predictor of judgments of identity. But when you put in the whole model, morality and description didn't, didn't predict anything at all. So this looks like what matters is valuing and not distinctively morality. But then we did a, a few more tests on this. Um, so what happens if you just pull out the morality predictor? What happens to the model? The morality view would say it should matter a lot because that's what's explaining the phenomenon. Well, what happens is nothing. The model basically stays the same. You get the same predictive value from valuing and affecting relationships. Well, but what happens if you take out the valuing predictor and there everything else is significant but morality turns out to be the least significant of all of them. And so what this suggests is that morality by itself um, really is pretty inert. It doesn't do a lot of work. Now this, um, this result, uh, is not something that everybody on our team is very happy with. Some people on the team um, wanted different results. However, they're absent and we're mad at them. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so we're gonna push on a little bit into. Um, so one way in which other members of our team have challenged these results is to say, look, this is the question we asked. How related to morality is the trait? Well, maybe what's going on here is people were thinking, oh, morality. They're just talking about like what other people think is moral. That's not what they're really thinking is moral. They're not thinking of immorality as they endorse it. Um, and then the other suggestion that has been made is that um, by our frenemies um, 
is that um, maybe these valued traits are moralized. People, when they value a trait, they moralize it. They think, oh, this is a morally important thing. And so Javi and I, um, behind, um, <laughs> behind their backs, uh, ran a study where we just looked, first of all, we took traits that weren't moralized. Like the, the lowest traits on moralization, as you see up here, these like um, intelligence, composure, humor, independently coded a different study. We found that people regarded these as very low in moralization. Um, and then we added a uh, new dependent measure. So these are, this is the design for the study. We asked, um, so this is the first part is the same as the other one. How different would you be if you took a drug that changed the following trait? Um, and then we asked the moralization question, which didn't say morality. It just said, to what extent do you think this would make someone a bad person if they lost this trait? And then the value question, how much do you value each of these traits? Um, and again, the, the moralization view would be moralization should be what drives this effect. It's when you think this trait is something that people are bad when they don't have it or they're worse when they have less of it. Whereas the value-centric account would say, what matters is whether you value the trade. It doesn't matter whether you think people are bad. What matters is whether you value it. And what we find, what found was strong support for the value theory. Again, value predicted judgments of identity. Moralization did not. Um, and that's true even though value and moralization were correlated. So the features of value that, that correlate with moralization, the moralization part isn't doing any of the work. The work is being done by the fact that you value it. So if I value something, regardless of whether it's moral, that leads me to think that that matters for personal identity. So before I turn it over to Javi, I want to mention one thing about um, a follow-up that we're starting to do. So everything we've done so far on this is focused on traits, personality traits. Um, but we're wondering, in our other work, we found that preferences make no, like people think that you can have different preferences and that doesn't matter for personal identity. But we haven't looked at this in the sort of individual differences way. And it, it's always seemed to me like, um, so I love indie rock, I care a lot about it, and my friend Eric um, loves indie rock and cares a lot about it, and I feel like if Eric stopped loving indie rock, if he stopped caring about it, that would be a huge assault to his personal identity. Javi loves techno, and I hate techno. I think techno is awful. I have carry no value for it. I feel like if Javi stops loving techno, that won't affect his personal identity at all, because you know who cares about techno? Um, um, so, while Nina and I were developing these projects, it turns out this is another like failure of deep integration. Javi and Jesse were running a study that addressed some of the questions that we were interested in. So I'll let Javi take over. Thanks, Sean. So um, uh, as Sean was mentioning, at the same time that Nina and him were working on these structural models that are very cool, Jesse and I stumbled on a similar pattern of findings, what we're calling the aesthetic self-effect. Now, what is that? Well, what we did is we took some cross-cultural studies where we looked at a series of characteristics, some of which we took to be moralized. There are four characteristics that we're going to go through in this particular model. Um, and what we're looking at is whether or not a change in these characteristics, so you'll see we have religion, political affiliation, musical taste, pastime, is going to result in a change to your personal identity, where zero on these scales would be completely different person, and six would be completely the same person. What we're expecting here is that a change in religion and politics, our moralized characteristics, will result in significant changes to identity. And in the US sample, that's exactly what we get. So change to religion, change to politic, political affiliation, they result in marked changes to person's judgments of their identity. Uh, and they're the only ones that do out of all the characteristics that we looked at. Um, but we wanted to look at a cross-cultural sample, and so we have a German sample available, which is the bars that just came up. And the reason we're interested in studying this sample is because in Germany, the political atmosphere is significantly less polarized than in America. So we took the same characteristics. We asked people the same kinds of questions. Imagine you change your political party affiliation. And we're looking for effects on people's perceptions of identity. And what we see is we do get the same effect in the religious context. Germans do find a change in religion to result in a change in identity. But we actually don't f find it in the political context, which is exactly what we predicted. 
That is, when Germans, when you ask Germans to imagine that they changed their political party affiliation, they don't see this as quite damaging to identity. Awkwardly, though, and kind of unexplained, uh, uh, well, we didn't have prior hypothesis about this, but a change in musical preferences in the German sample was, uh, felt, was read as a market change in identity. Um, and we, we were not expecting this. In fact, it had the second largest impact on, cha on, on changes to identity on our dependent measure. And we wanted to figure out why. And in our example, we asked participants to imagine that they went from liking only classical music to only pop music. So we thought maybe there's something weird about the way we frame the question. Because after all, when you think about classical music in Germany, well, who do you have? Basically everybody, Bach, Beethoven, you pick them. So we thought maybe there's something weird going on and it's our choice of the genres that's driving this effect here. So we said, okay, how do we figure out what the, the genres look like? Uh, and so what we did is we used what's called a multiple dimensional scaling technique to, and we asked participants in an American sample and a German sample to tell us how similar different genres were to each other in order to map out a kind of conceptual space of these genres. And for our American sample, oh wow, well that's not supposed to do that, sorry. Um, we have a number of 10 genres, but don't worry, you'll see the important part in a second. These two that are highlighted in red are actually pop and classical music. Somehow the, 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 the information kind of came out. You'll see that they're, they're, in these that they're in these locations. Now take our German sample, the map actually looks quite similar. And more importantly, you'll see that the pop and classical music genres are in the same locations. Um, you'll have to take my word for that, but what this shows us is if this is the case, if the conceptual map of genres, of genres are pretty similar between our two samples, then it's not our effect, this kind of weird effect on identity in the German sample cannot be explained as a simple kind of cultural artifact. Uh, so what are some, what's going on here? Well, we like to term it the aesthetic self-effect, namely taste matters. And one explanation draws on what Sean and Nita talked about. What drives the effect is what people value and Germans just uh, are more ho homogeneous in highly valuing music than American. That's one prediction, one hypothesis at least. Um, so perhaps Germans value music more than other populations. And for anybody who doesn't know, I actually just came from Berlin. And in Berlin, I'm gonna give you a little piece of pro tip here. This is the Berlin summer uniform. If you see somebody wearing this uniform and with assorted maybe uh, tattoos and other, and other items, they're going to like techno music. This is gonna be a very, or at least it's gonna be very highly correlated with them liking techno music. And I guess I'm bringing this up because, at least for Berliners, it seems like musical tastes and how that, 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 that's represented in their other choices and their other activities, it seems to be pretty critical, crucial to their identity. Oh, and Jesse pops up in there. Um, so I wanna move on to a second one. Oh dear, <laughs> I think this is an older one. Um, I wanna move to a, a second study uh, that we've been running this past year. This is, in all honesty, this is led by Nina and she's done most of the work on this who sadly couldn't be here today, as Sean mentioned. So we're looking at corporate uh, identity. And why are we doing this? Well, in our previous studies, we've seen that morality seems to be central to individual personal identity, but we wanna see how this scales up when we look at larger groups such as, collect, uh, collectives such as corporations. Why is this relevant? Well, of course, there's legal precedent to consider corporations as people, uh, and there's some cultural, corpora uh, some cultural precedent as well. So Mitt Romney, as you recall, will say corporations are people, my friend, and our first Supreme Court uh, justice oops, said corporations have the same right and as natural persons and contract and to, to contract and enforce contracts. So there's legal and cultural precedents to take this view, but we wanna know if this view is just a metaphor or if there's something more substantial driving it. So in order to do this, actually, uh, Nina took the same study design as the reincarnation effect that Sean talked about earlier, where we looked at either moralized or personality traits, and we had individuals, uh, basically some, it's a between subject design where some people saw either a person changing on various of these traits or a corporation, a generic corporation changing on various of these, on these various traits. And what we see is, in the person, uh, we get a replication of the effect for people, that is the moral traits are what matters most in predicting this degree of identity change. 
And what's interesting and what we predicted and what we're happy to find is that we get the same relative effect for corporation, for generic corporation. Um, we do have a couple variants that we're working on currently. So one is whether or not mission statements uh, could count as core of uh, as a core of uh, a corporate identity. So, for example, Google says "Do no evil," and uh, Amazon says "Be relentless." And you know these might encode different kind of moral values. So maybe if you change those mission statements, that might change how people perceive that corporation as being the same as it was before. Also, we're looking at differences between stakeholder and stockholder-run corporations and see if those encode some of these. Uh, moral values and if people can pick up on those values and the changes in those values. So here's some tentative conclusions. Uh, the power of the moral self-effect, it extends to groups such as corporations. It'd be nice to see how far it goes, whether it goes to other large agents. And the fact that we regard corporate identity in terms of moral character might affect economic decisions down the line. Something to think about. So this is the project that I'm most excited about. Uh, and that I'm currently very invested in. It's the idea of looking at the moral self through migrant and migration context. So some background here, which is gonna rehash some of the stuff we talked, is that we know that the moral self effect is robust, but we have to test it in real world cases where folks do change. So we already looked at parole cases, that's what we talked about last year, and we found that yes, in parole style cases where we have these kind of fictional uh, cases where people do change morally, people are perceived to having changed their identity. But we want to look at another significant social context, namely immigration, which is pertinent today, I think. So we did a number of designs. Here's just an example of it. We're using a two by two in between subjects design that pits a change in values against a change in the direction of movement. So for our first example, we have a guy named George and he moves from the US to the United Arab Emirates. And there's a reason we're picking that country. And we describe him as assimilating. And once he assimilates, he adopts a change of value. And we exemplify that change of value by looking at the issue of uh, women and covering themselves with a veil, a veil in public. So in the value change condition, he goes from women should not cover their heads to women should cover their heads with a veil in public. In the no value change condition, as you can imagine, he retains his previous values or his previous idea that women should not cover their heads with a veil in public. For Youssef, when Youssef moves from the UAE to the USA to get a job and to, he fully assimilates, he goes from believing that women should cover their heads with a veil to women should not. And in the no value change condition, he continues to believe that women should cover their heads with a veil. Veil, sorry. We have a few measures that we're testing here. So one is our character measure, which is uh, to what extent is George or Youssef a better or worse person after his time in the USA or the UAE? or the UAE or the USA, and we have our moral self measure. So to, in this scenario, to what extent is George or Yusuf the same person as before? It's pretty much the same measure we've been using in a lot of the studies that Jesse and I have been running. So, oh, I hope this works. <laughs> so we're gonna look at the character measure for, and here, uh, first, and here are four conditions. So these are the value change conditions, no value change, George and Yusuf. And we expect that our American sample, because that's who we're testing currently, is American participants, is going to see the adoption of Emirati values as a bad thing, right? And the retention of American values as a good thing. And it, likewise, when Yusuf comes over and changes his values to match our values, we'll probably see that to be a really good thing. So that's our prediction. And lo and behold, that's actually what we get. So when Yusuf adopts American values, we think that's a great change in character, that he's a better person. When George adopts Emirati values, less so. So moving on to our moral self measure. Here we have the four conditions as well. Don't know why it looks ugly, sorry. Uh, and we expect that the strongest predictor of identity change is gonna be this axis, so whether or not you change your values. Independent of all other factors. And that's actually what we find. It's actually really quite robust. There are no significant differences within the value change conditions or the no value change conditions, but as you can see, it's, it's a, a huge effect that we get. And then when you actually, there's a, again a main effect, but when you actually pair it next to the character measure, you can see that the moral self effect, it seems independent of people's perceptions of character change. I think this is something you know, we need to think more about, but it's a pretty cool finding. So a summary, just to kind of recap, because we have another project to talk about. I don't know how many minutes do I have. Um, the moral self-effect 
in cases of immigration, we, we do get a moral self-effect in cases of immigration. We have some possible confounds with this. So in the no value change conditions, we said that they do not assimilate, right? So that might be a confound. Also, there might, this is a gendered value, right? We're talking about women and head coverings. And so maybe there's an effect of gender. But I want to tell you guys, and if you're interested, just ask me. <laughs> we have control for assimilation, and we got no effect on the moral self-measure. We controlled for female names and pronouns. We had no effect on the moral self-measure. We controlled for behavior as an example. So a, a woman decides to change her behaviors to actually wear the veil rather than just change her normative attitudes. It mitigates the moral self, which is interesting, but does not eliminate the effect. Then we also used Western values, so as opposed to uh, a Arab value, as we thought. And we get a flipped character measure, so that it, we are tracking something real with the character measure. But again, we have no effect on moral self. So we still get the moral self effect across all these variants. So there's some future steps I'm really excited about. One is we're doing cross-cultural comparison. Actually, like as soon as I get back to Berlin, we're running this on a uh, German sample. And we hope to run it in the UAE at al Ain University with some of Jesse's colleagues in the fall. So that's, that, that's why we picked the Arab Emirates as our, as our test case. Also, we want to compare this to other predictions from other theories of identity. Um, and we think this might be a good paradigm to actually put these different theories on the map. Um, was that it? No, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, I, here's my question. It seems to me that um, there could be a conflation between valuation and taste, or valuation and preference. Because you talked about valuation in the moral self, uh, moral self effect study that you first uh, mentioned. And then when you got to the aesthetic selves, you talked about taste. And um, I'm thinking that preferences or taste, which I would equate with tastes, and valuations can pull apart. You know, so you consider, for example, the case of Yusuf. And I'm not going to use your example. I'm going to have a little another example here just to, to show how these can pull apart. And that is that Yusuf moves from the United Arab Emirates to the USA and develops a taste for grilled cheese, okay? And so he comes to like grilled cheese and no longer uh, likes as much the Emirati foods that he has eaten. And so when he has a choice, he chooses the grilled cheese over the Emirati foods. But he still values the Emirati foods because he believes that they are, you know, part of his cultural heritage and tradition. So I'm wondering if you have, you know, in fact, uh, put in some sort of a clever corrective for that, that taste valuation uh, distinction in some of these studies. The way I would think about that, Nancy, is that um, the grilled cheese case is not one that they actually value. And so I, I think I probably agree with what you're saying because I don't think that, you know, changing the, eating the odd grilled cheese sandwich is not something that you think people could strongly identify with as a value. Um, whereas, and, and so, I mean, I think that with aesthetic cases, Sometimes you think people's aesthetic judgments are just not very significant. I mean, you just like, I mean, I, I really do have that view about techno. I just don't care about techno. It's, I don't object to it, but it's just not something that I value. And so I don't, I, it's hard for me to think that it matters that much for someone else's personal identity. I just can't see how it could. But that's, I, I regard, I know that that's kind of like a shortcoming of projection, but I think that's just a natural way that when we think about other people, we think about it in terms of our values. And when we come up with examples of changes that, that, we, that have to do with taste, but don't have to mm -hmm. do with identified values, then it just seems like they don't, they don't matter. I guess just what was in my mind, and sort of as a follow-up here, is whether some of the studies of valuations of traits might in fact be preferences for traits and not true valuations of traits. So I might have a preference for a trait of, um, uh, I, I don't think I saw this up there, but you know, bookwormishness, you might say, or a preference for a, a trait of scholarliness mm -hmm. in an individual as opposed to uh, adventurousness, mm -hmm. or a preference mm -hmm. for the trait of sober, I don't know, uh, gregariousness over something else, mm -hmm. or introversion right. over extroversion, right. that, that I would not necessarily mean that I value right. these traits, but that I have a preference for them. And I wonder if that is something that you have 
taken into account or would do in your study? That's what we want to do. So, I mean, I think that the, we want to do it with respect to content, though, not because everything we've done so far, well, the stuff I reported today has been about character traits generally. Mm -hmm. and, but we really want to look at preferences that we know if you just look at preferences, then preferences don't predict judgments of identity. So that's the, all the work that we did before, preferences don't matter at all. But the individual differences might be because some preferences you value, like I value my preference for indie rock. I don't value, um, I don't value my dispreference for techno or something like that. And so preferences themselves are not going to drive it. It's only valued preferences that I think will probably make this difference. Um, I'm going to But step Javi, in. did you want to jump in on well, that? Well, no, I just wanted to say, so I think that would be really interesting to test with the um, the immigration cases, and there's two results that I'll bring up for that. So one, when we when we tested the assimilation variant, what we did is we controlled, we say they assimilate in all, they culturally assimilate in all conditions, right? So that means they adopt the local food, dress, customs, but not the values. So that's one thing. Now you're saying, well, maybe they really do value the grilled cheese, right? Okay, so it's just the, the, the preferences might be driving it, I see. I see. And so, so I think that you know, we might be able to toy with that example a little bit to get at that, and I think that would be a great extension. But more also, when we did the other study, the one I presented with the German, uh, cross the first German cross-cultural study, we asked, one of the things we asked is imagine your food preferences ta change. So your food tastes change. Um, and we did that spicy foods, because Germans are very averse to spicy foods. But, um, and we got, everybody likes food. <laughs> They're like, yeah, food's great. It's important <laughs> to me. We didn't ask if it was valuable. We asked if it was important. And clearly, we got ceiling effects there. But people were like, yeah, if I started liking spicy food, no, nah, no, nah, I'm still me, right? And other people would still think I'm me. So, but I agree, it, we're, we're missing a little, little bit of overlap there that would be really productive. I'm gonna step in with a question before going to our list. No. Uh, you're studying uh, perceptions from a third person point of view, right? Third person being myself in the future or something, or those other people. Uh, a lot of what we've been hearing about from our interview studies is first person point of view mm. on their moral selves. And I'm wondering if you've thought about shifting or what, what would be different? Because what happens with the interviews is they're, they're telling, explaining the shift right, in moral yeah. self, although they don't see a shift, mm. but they have shifted over time, yeah. over decades. I was just wondering if you thought about the moral self effect from a first person point of view. Uh, well, one, so one thing that we hope to do is, this is um, Jesse, um, is actually talk to people with PTSD, because mm -hmm. the, the yeah. thing that, Javi was going to talk about these studies, but they didn't come out so well, and so it didn't seem like it was worth your time for us to go through them, but, but there were a bunch of studies on PTSD and people's judgments about change in PTSD. What we find is that the predicted thing, which is that people regard PTSD as changing personal identity, but the moral self component there did not provide a distinctive explanatory, but, but it might be because there are vignette, basically vignette studies, and really talking to people with trauma, might, we might find something very different. And so we want to do that and get a sense of whether the moral self, because one thing, like the study that Nina and I did on family members with dementia, mm -hmm. what we found, it was striking that we found people who actually have loved ones who they are dealing with, memory does not matter. Not every time we do these studies, memories matter some. But people who are living with somebody who has Alzheimer's, they're like, that doesn't matter to me at all. What matters to me is that that person is nice to me. That person still, he still pulls, remember one of these stories is like, he still pulls a chair out for me at dinner. Like he can't remember anything, but he always pulls a chair out for me at dinner. That's what people really resonate with. And you just wouldn't know that if you didn't talk to real people who had these conditions. And so getting yeah. to people with, who, who've experienced trauma is really important. It's hard to get those populations, but that's. The other thing I would mention is we, we have just tested our vignettes, uh, in some of the vignette studies that we've done, uh, with uh, first and third person variants, right? So like yeah. imagine uh, you change, imagine uh, well, from first and third person perspective, sorry. So imagine you change, how different would you feel you are, how different would- That's still third person though. Would another person perceive you to be? So yeah, I mean, but it's still third person because you're imagining yourself uh, right, right. external so, so to it's who you are it's now. So it's yeah, yeah, it's well, still third person to me. If we get more money. <laughs> 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 Those are. <laughs> okay, we have on my list, I have Will, uh, Walt, uh, I can't read my handwriting, Gus, uh, Colin, and, and Valerie. 
Okay, and then Michael. Well, I, I think it's great that you're getting into the mechanisms, and, and I think the two that you started with are, of course, the or, you know the intuitive ones to start with, or the great great ones to start with. But it, but it, this kind of strikes me as kind of interesting because I think the question originated with, you know, what provides what I think philosophers call numerical identity, and what psychologists might call continuity over time. You know, so why are you the same person you were 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. And um, you know what is the thing that provides sameness? And I think that what's been so compelling about the memory hypothesis is that it naturally provides sameness, right? You're having the same memories. You know, it's almost like you're having the same consciousness. So you're the same. You're just having the same experiences over time. So that makes you be the same person you were 20 years ago. But then the two explanations you came up with for morality don't really have much to do with sameness. They don't. They don't seem to provide any similarity or sameness. They, right. they have to do with valuing. And I'm not sure yeah. how my valuing of a trait that two people might have makes those two people the same person, just yeah. because I value that trait. And right. I'm wondering if you have any hypotheses about why it would provide that sameness or that continuity over time. So I'll go out on my own on this. I, I mean, Jesse, I haven't talked to Jesse about this or Javi, but I think that they're just two different systems. So the system that you use when you're judging your identity with a past person through memory is a different system. So like, I know that my traits have changed dramatically since my first kiss. Like, that's obvious to me, but it's not like when I think, oh yeah, there was that, that adolescent who kissed a girl who's very different from me. I think, no, I, that, finally a girl kissed me. Like, I, it's not like I don't think that that's a different person. I just think, yes, like success. Like, um, but, um, but I think that that's just, your memory, the episodic memory doesn't care at all about the traits. So social psychologists, when they think about the self, they think about it as a collection of traits. And that's, that's the tradition that we're working within. Um, and you're right that that's not going to get you sameness. One of the things that actually, so when we first presented these results um, to social psychologists, they were, su they were really surprised by the results um, because they thought, look, it's not distinctive. Like, you know, it, like the fact that you're nice, like so many people are nice. Um, so it doesn't distinguish you from anybody. What matters is that you're like a red-headed philosopher from Montana who's really bad at basketball. Like that's, that's the thing that's distinctive about Sean. That's who you really are deep down. I'm like, no, I'm just a nice boy. Like that's who I am deep down. Um, so, so I think they're different processes and I think you're right. And I think that it's just not been I don't think that's been attended to very well in that literature. Um, I mean, at all, I think that, so I think that, yeah. That's. I think this is great. I mean, I, I, I love this work um, because I think it has a lot of applicability uh, where I come from with vets. I think this would be really informative uh, when we're looking at the psychology of the veteran when they come back from conflict or some sort of transition and how they have changed. Because a lot of, we, we hear a lot about how, what vets lose yeah. is their, some of their moral self. Right. And so I have lots of questions for you um, uh -uh. as far as how we could apply this um, going forward in that domain. But I do have a couple questions uh, about the technical stuff you, that you guys did here. So I'm curious as to what the theory was behind why you picked the three countries you did. Because I'm trying to figure out, does this fit the self-construal, uh, you know, the way we've kind of looked at interdependence and independence, that breakdown? Is it tight, loose? Is it the Gelfand stuff? I mean, where, how did you guys come to decide those three countries? Um, the second one, have, have, you have you thought about looking at like an acute transition? Like, um, back to what Darsha was saying. Uh, Sorry? Like, like what Darsh was saying, like in real time, like ask people, you know, give me an assessment of your moral values or your, your, your character or your moral behavior, and then longitudinally through some sort of transition event, ask them again, and then, and then look at it as kind of, does this cause this? And the one thing I thought of is, is basic training. You know, when a soldier, when, a, when, we, when we transition from civilian to soldier, they do, they, over and over again, you ask parents or you ask people that are close to this person or the person themselves, and what they say is, I change, I'm more honorable, I'm more honest, I'm more teamwork, you know, so all these moral qualities start to come out, and I, I think that might be something that you might want to consider, like look at that in real time in an acute transition, both going into the military, and another one is the transition out, which is something I'm interested in, because that's very rough. Coming out of the military and it's back in the civilian world, 
is a very jarring experience for veterans. And so something that you might want to consider is applying this in that context because it could be very helpful yeah. so, uh, to a population. Sure. Do you um, want to take the first one? And then the last <laughs> thing I, I, I want to ask, because I think this is the science, the big, I mean, kind of a con, uh, argument that you might face in, in the literature or in social psychology especially, is that there are, there are scientists out there, and uh, most, uh, the center right now is the Van Babel Lab at NYU that says kind of the opposite of what you're saying, and that is morality is special. And you're almost making the counter argument, which I, I personally agree with, that it's not, um, psychologically speaking. It's mm -hmm. about values and mm -hmm. you know, attitudes and, and, and what's right. important to you. And yeah. so have you gotten a dialogue with that, with that uh, group of scientists? No, I mean, so I, I guess, let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll answer a couple of these, and then I'll let Javi take. Um, I, I think that morality is special, actually. I think that there's a lot of reason to think morality is special. But it, the specialness of morality doesn't manifest in these. That my, my view is that it, the specialness of morality doesn't matter for the personal identity judgments. What matters is the valuing. So you still might think, as I do, that morality is treated as distinctive in various ways. Like it, you know, I mean, the classic studies on the moral conventional distinction. I think that I think those are good studies, and that I think they hold up under under a lot of harsh scrutiny. They hold up pretty well, and so I do think morality is special. But when you're making these judgments about identity, you know, your, your non-moral values are also really important. And so I think that when it comes to those judgments, it's just a, it's just a pile of things that you value. And, not, and mal morality is special, but that's just part of the big pile of things that you value when it comes to those decisions. Um, it might turn out that there's still a spe an extra morality effect, and that's one thing we're going to look at when we, the thing that Javi and I have done that I told you we did behind their backs. Um, We'll, we will elaborate that now that they will know about it, um, and we'll, we'll run a fuller version of that, and we'll see whether maybe morality actually does have some extra effect yeah, yeah. over those other ones. So that's still a possibility. The, the idea of looking at people in the military after ba through basic training at the end, we would love to do that. that. That is something that would be so high on the list of priorities for us that if we had an opportunity to do that, I, we would jump on it. So let, let's talk, yeah. Yeah, and just uh, kind of jumping off that point, uh, so Jesse and I have been looking at uh, the moral injury stuff, so looking at particularly PTSD vignettes, right? And the problem is with uh, non-military population that we're sampling, it's, it's maybe not the right group because we're not getting a lot of the effects in these pilot studies. So that's something, you know, if we'll, we'll show you and we'll chat about. And I think Jesse's very, and Jesse and Sean and I are all very excited to look at that in these, in these cases. Um, but with some of the more nitty-gritty questions, the, th the three countries we chose of, I assume you mean the US, Germany, and, and the United Arab Emirates. Right, right. Uh, so unfortunately, I would like to say there is, but and there, and in fact, we kind of thought that would be a good idea, especially because Jesse uh, has access to populations in both countries, in Germany and the UAE. So that's particularly what helped constrain those choices. But, the, it was an opportunity, absolutely, yeah. and we're very, and uh, you know, the, the research that we've done with the German colleagues has been like really eye-opening, especially given that the refugee crisis, for instance, in Germany is a very salient topic, whereas it's kind of less so here, but immigration, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice almost uh, control condition for us, the U.S. Well, Yeah. Yeah. Map it out and see if there is something that you could Great. use as to explain some Absolutely. of these effects, like yeah. why music is important to Germans. I mean, that's right. kind of odd to me, you know, like right. why that was why you got that. Sure. Um, and that, so, uh, one last question. I'm sorry to dominate this, but one because I'm really interested in the work. One one last question is: most of your s situations are bad or good to bad. Like, uh, you know, my husband, as he got older, he's no longer pulling my chair. He's no longer nice. Right. And so, we know that the bad is stronger than the good. So. What about if we looked at it in the opposite direction, where someone went through a, a, a spiritual exercise or some right. sort of um, awe-inducing event or some sort of developmental transition, and they became better? Do you think you'd see the same uh, effect? We do. Yeah. So in the parole, we, in the parole context, we actually kind of have a control condition where people just realize like crime doesn't pay. <laughs> you know, I got to keep my head down. I got to try to get parole, and the parole board can sense this. And then we have a moral change condition where they can actually sense that their values have changed. They're genuinely, like, they've seen the light in a way. And we get a, a very robust moral self-effect there. 
but also in the immigration case. We actually kind of, that, that when, you, when Americans see somebody as adopting Emirati values, they, they think that's a bad thing. So we kind of change it to be another value of uh, uh, drug and alcohol consumption. And when Americans, when you change towards an Emirati standard where that's no longer allowed, Americans see that change as quite positive. So we're able to f manipulate this. And the cool thing is the moral self-effect still happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks. This was awesome. Um, I really appreciate the kind of more applied direction and some of the stuff you talked about at the end. I think that's great. Um, so the question <laughs> I have is, is um, I'm wondering if you can say a bit more about some of the DVs you use to get at like relationships, um, changes to relationships, because it strikes me that in the same way you think that the moral self-effect might be down to like a more general domain of valuation, you might also think that morality is just a sort of species of a more general domain of like social relationships or communities. Um, so I guess I'm just curious what DVs you use in particular, and then also if you have a sort of like theoretically motivated way to talk about something like non-moral social changes or if those all get lumped in together or if they're sort of difficult to pull apart, something to that effect. I'm not sure I can give a very solid, I mean, I can tell you the DV. The DV was very simple, actually, I think I showed it. Okay. It was um, how important is this for, you know, friends and long-term partners or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and we, we used other versions in earlier studies that were pretty much the same. And it turns out like that, that does matter, that value, that variable makes a difference. Um, mm. Now, I don't know that I can directly address the other question. I will say that, so let's suppose that you think of, so I guess it matters and you might wonder, well, how does the fact that it matters, like that, that matters, that, so if the trait matters for relationships, how does that map onto the value approach? And you might think that it isn't just whether someone is a good person that makes me want to decide whether to hang out with them. It's also whether they like indie rock. Like mm -hmm. that does make a mm -hmm. difference. Um, and so and I, don't, I don't like, the, if there's something I care about passionately, then it really matters to my affiliations to find people who also have that passion. And so um, I think that could explain why you get the affiliation, even if the value is actually at the core. The value is really what's at the core. Because remember, the, DV, the, 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 the real question of what we're interested in here is, does it change who you are? And the values may drive that, and they also may be strongly associated with these judgments of, is that a person that I would want to be with? Yeah, because and, they have my value. And jumping on that, so Jesse and uh, some colleagues in Germany, uh, Katarina Helming at Leipzig, uh, have been looking at a study they call sleeping with the enemy mm -hmm. and it's basically looking at looking at how much the value changes right tracking that manipulating that judgment and seeing like how comfortable would you be being a classmate being a coworker, you know having a one night stand being in a 10 year relationship being together forever so it's it, we're, we're actively looking at ways to map these these social effects so I think that's a great question yeah, that's cool thanks for saying Okay, so I have uh, two questions, uh -oh. and the uh, first one is, well, <laughs> I was gonna say it's flippant, but it's, uh, but it's not <laughs> entirely. Um, so if it's really values and not morality that are doing, that's doing the work here, like what, what characteristics you value, don't you have to stop calling it the moral self effect? <laughs> okay. now, the, the more uh, substantive question, has, your example about techno made me think of something that might be an interesting way to sort of pursue this idea of the importance of value. Um, what if you manipulated the degree to which the person knew that the other person who's changing valued the thing, right? So is it only about what is it only about what I value? Like I value creativity, and so if you become uncreative, then I think that you've changed. But what if uh, what if you tell me a story about this person and you make it really clear to me that that person values creativity really highly, mm. regardless of whether I value right. creativity? And then something happens and he loses creativity. Um, does that cause me to believe that he's changed more than if I think that he didn't right. value creativity. Yeah, we haven't done that directly. We've done things that, that suggest that that isn't gonna matter, but we haven't, we haven't tackled it directly. I can't remember what the study was that we did, but, but um, uh, yeah, in any case, I think it won't matter because I think that like, 
Javi can say, you, I just love techno, and I'll, th I'll think, they're there, Javi. Like, um, that's <laughs> fine. That's good for you to like techno. Um, I don't think I would let, I would think that, but what really matters is, like, songs. Like, you know, you have to have, you can't have a deep relationship with just pulses. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, that just shows that you're unsophisticated <laughs> when it comes to techno. But no, but but seriously though, like let's say let's say he let's say his whole life revolves around techno. He dresses in the uniform that he showed us. Uh, I should have worn it. I really should have worn it. He DJ yeah. like he's getting into the actual DJing. He's yeah. making the music. Like yeah. this is his life. And then and you know this about him. That's and true. then you turn. It turns out that uh, yeah. you know he has an accident and can no longer keep a beat. <laughs> it's like, uh, and it's just gone. He doesn't care anymore. Yeah. He dresses like in a tie, and who knows, you know, it's all gone. Right. <laughs> Don't you think that you? I think, I think at a certain point, yeah, you'd have to go along yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. As for calling it the moral self effect, I probably would be in favor of of not keeping that label so so prominent anyway. Yeah. But expect to see it in the future. I had Colin's flippant question too, so I'm, I'm glad that got answered. Um, but I, actually, I really just wanted to know um, why, I think, Sean, you said when you made the case that it's values, not morality per se, that's driving this, that your colleagues were unhappy. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to know why they were unhappy. Is it just, did Jesse trademark the moral self, mm -hmm. and so he, mm -hmm. he doesn't want to have to go back on, I or think is there a better there are two There are two things that are so one thing is, if it was the if it was just morality, then that would suggest some sort of interesting special thing that was going on. The problem is that if it was just morality, you'd still need to know, but why? Like, what's the story about why morality is doing that? Whereas the value one, it's just like, it's mm -hmm. not. Imp lots of philosophers have said, like the like the Watson theory, like the self is the set of values. That's what it is, and so. That theory just sort of fits into a tradition that I understand well enough, and I see how you would get this, res this moral self result as a consequence of that. Um, uh, whereas the moral, if it's just the moral domain that's important, then you have a new theory. Um, so I kind of like, I like the value-centric approach because I understand how it works and that it produces this result. The moral one is sort of like sexier if that were true because it would be something really unusual um, that people hadn't done before. But. but yeah, I also think that there might be like a hybridized. So I think the way Jesse likes to spin it is something like uh, it's moralization. So when you, when you moralize something, right, it could be anything, but you basically see it as occupying different moral spheres, for instance. And when you have groups that occupy different moral spheres, this, this is gonna look like a real change if you can actually go between them, right? So in a sense, it's like a prism that you can uh, use when you really, really value something, you almost moralize it in a way. So there's a kind of hybridized approach somewhere there. We're still working it out, obviously. Yes, thank you very much. I, I'm interested in if we have a brain-based explanation for why they've changed, whether we still think they've changed. So I have a friend that developed schizophrenia quite severely in her 30s, and she just was completely, she took up smoking, she, you know, all these things that just changed completely, but I knew why she did it. And if she's on the right drugs, you can kind of get her back, but mm -hmm. kind of not. Mm -hmm. um, so do people judge based, and you could have depression, any of these mental illnesses, you could have extreme depression, uh, where they value different things as a result of depression or value nothing because of depression. Um, so mm. I'm just wondering whether brain-based explanations help people make a determination whether they've changed? So I think there's, um, the answer is that it doesn't actually matter what the etiology is, it's striking. So <laughs> we, Jesse and I found this, and then Nina and Leanne Young found it in a different way, that even if you decide, so like, you, so the way Jesse and I did it, you're hiking in the mountains and you fall down <coughs> and you hit your head and you think, my God, I've been living for other people. Not because you have brain damage, you're just like, what an idiot I've been. I've been living for other people, I could have died. I've gotta start living for myself and not stop giving to charities. And it didn't matter, it wasn't like I, I did this agentive thing and therefore it's still me. People still thought you were a different person in that case. What seems really interesting about the case that you're talking about is their fluctuations. Mm -hmm. That we have not looked at at all, but you know, I wonder, that, that's actually super interesting. There may be something there where you think, because you know, when people get brain damage, I have a friend whose daughter got, has TBI after a motorcycle accident, 
And it's clear that her daughter is basically has so little, so little cognitive ability, but she says, she still says particular phrases that she used to say before her injury. And I know that Karen thinks that that's, that's Rachel coming through, whereas someone else might think those are shards of like a broken mind. Like that's not, it's not like she's still deep down witty. She just had those sentences that she, could, she can pull out at various times. But so Karen definitely sees her daughter as the same person and it's deep down she's still there and we just get these little glimpses of it at times. Um, whereas that, that doesn't seem all that plausible when you think about it as a clinician, I think. Um, but when there are real dips and you actually see people transitioning, do you think that it's the high points that make them who they are or the low points who make them who they are? We, or the pattern. We, or the pattern, yeah, right, the pattern. yeah, that, that um, we should definitely look at that. I'm also thinking of a particular case of a, of a male philosopher that had a brain injury and then became a harasser. <laughs> what? Is that um, him? Yeah. I would think, I would think no. I would think yeah. that that counts as a change in yeah. self. I would yeah. think that's actually a good, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. Uh, I don't know that I'd ever use that example, but that seems like a really good example. <laughs> With him either, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, our last question from Ross. I, I would, I would urge you to think more about this question. It's a really interesting one, yeah. and think about it in relation to um, some therapeutic approaches for addictive disorders, where you are succeeding. Where for addictive, addictive disorders, where you're succeeding in convincing your client that it's not that um, that they are addicted; it's that their brain has oh. become addicted. Right. And so they're able to maintain a sense of my being a person with self-control, but right. my brain has been changed as a result of my right. prolonged drug use, my prolonged right. alcohol use. Right. I was actually gonna ask a different question, um, because you've, you've talked about the Alzheimer's example by, uh, by contrast with frontotemporal dementia. Yeah. But in fact, personality often does change in the context of Alzheimer's. That's one of the right. reasons that mm. Alzheimer's is different than other forms of dementia, and that yeah. you do get personality changes. Right. Right. So I'm intrigued by the frequency with which you've mentioned that people believe that their Alzheimer's afflicted relatives are basically the same. They're the right. same sweet person. They pull out right. the chair, et cetera, et cetera. Because in fact, yeah. oftentimes these people are reporting is, my, my relative has changed right. and they aren't the same right. person that they were. So it strikes me that you've got a condition in which um, it might be possible to look at variability in how people perceive the degree of personality change and then ask to the, what extent are they the same person right. that they were before. I, I oversimplified this study. We actually, so we, we got those populations, and there was also ALS patients because we wanted um, largely non-psychological um, degenerative conditions. Um, and then we just measured their judgments to which the person, their morals had changed, and we had a bunch of different things. And that, the analysis was done over people's perceived, uh, loved ones' um, perceptions of changes on particular dimensions. And it turns out you could cluster FTD and Alzheimer's pretty easily, but, but the real analysis was done just in terms of the identified traits. The other thing I should mention though, I said morality was the only thing that had an effect, but the other thing, totally we didn't predict this, memory made no difference, aphasia made a difference. Mm. So the extent to which people couldn't talk, because it probably was productive aphasia, that made a difference in the sense, in the extent to which they thought they were the same person. I mean, it wasn't nearly as large as the moral effect, but it was, it was there. And I mean, I'm still a little, I mean, I guess it's the lack of engagement maybe, it's, but, but that we haven't followed up. I've, I'm intrigued by that fact. So, yeah. All right, let's thank our speakers.